Welcome to the Australian Property Investment Podcast with your host, Aaron Christie David. Each episode, we ask an expert to share their key insights for aspiring investors to make confident property choices. G'day, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Australian Property Investment Podcast. We stand for helping investors make quality and better decisions when it comes to buying an investment property. Our aim of our chats is always to answer frequently asked questions and also to chat to an expert for a particular topic. And today's topic we're going to talk about is building and pest report. And I'm joined by Greg Flood from Inspect Wollongong. G'day, Greg. How are you doing? I'm really good. How are you yourself? Mate, I'm doing great. Thanks. Uh, mate, thanks for joining us. And I love having a chat about building and pest reports because it's one of those topics that people can skip over or glance over, but it's a great saying, a stitch in time saves nine. And it's one of these worthy costs and worthy investments that when you're looking to buy an investment property, it's a very, very small cost, but uh, it can lead to big a, a big peace of mind to know that you're not buying uh, a home that has some, some issues as well. So what we want to do is answer uh, the questions that we have, which is, when do I engage a property inspector? When do I, what should I be looking for in the report? And so we're going to go through those questions. But before sure. we do kick off, Greg, I just want to, just a little bit about yourself personally and professionally, man, and, and, and launching Inspect Wollongong. Can you just share okay. with us your, your, your story in a nutshell, mate? Uh, well, Inspect uh, Wollongong um, is a business that I operate with my wife, Sharon. Yep. Um, we've been in business in this in this business for about seven years, I suppose, give or take. Um, prior to that, I was um, in the building game, as a licensed builder. Yeah. Um, I spent some time in the New South Wales Police. Um, yeah, that's pretty much what I do, yeah. Excellent, mate. And I mean, I, in seven years, you've probably seen a lot change, uh, not only in the, 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 the market, but I guess the demand for your services as well, isn't it? Oh, oh yeah, absolutely. Um uh, there's a little bit of uh, it's a very litigious industry that that I'm in. Yeah. Um, but it also it's an industry that's necessary to put um, people's minds at ease when they're when they're buying probably the biggest investment of their life. So. Absolutely, absolutely. Now you just mentioned that, you mentioned litigious, right? Mm-hmm. What what makes the industry litigious? Is it the fact that there's some liability on the report that you know that you should be seeing something that maybe people miss, or what makes what makes it litigious? Well. People are asking, are wanting your expert opinion. So, you, you know, they're engaging me as a consultant to give my expert advice on something that they may not know about. So mm. they want some reassurance. They want some guarantee that what they're paying for um, is going to give them some peace of mind to sleep at night, I suppose. So yeah, um, that's probably it. Um, if something does go wrong, they want to know that, okay, well, they've engaged somebody. Um, they want to know that um, if, it does, if something does go wrong and it hasn't been picked up, then they can... Um, you know, they've got some sort of, you know, recourse. Yeah, recourse to to fix up the problem, I suppose. Do you have liability on your reports? One hundred percent. Anyone in this industry, if if you're operating and you don't have um, professional indemnity insurance, then um, you know you're waiting to to be attacked, I suppose. So, mm-hmm. um, and it, it's a common question. Clients do ask, "Are you insured?" Um, and you know, I think you have to be. Um, you're opening yourself up to a huge expense if you're not. So, without a doubt. And how long is the validity on this report, for example. So when you when you write up your report and you send it to a client, how long is that report's shelf life? I, look, generally three months. You know, I wouldn't okay. say anything more than ninety days. Uh, oh, sorry, you know, one hundred twenty days. But um, it's it does have some sort of shelf life a little bit longer there when we talk about um, you know the three months. It's sort of relating to more more the pest side of things, so the termite side of things, because um. You know, we could do an inspection and the next day termites could um finding you know entry into the home. So mm-hmm. that's that's where it's important that the that the the client um knows that the the shelf life of the of the report generally relates to, you know, things can change within the property, but predominantly it's termites. So yeah. yeah. Uh mate, I'll probably go back a step because we I do you just mentioned that so I want to touch on that, but just go back a step and oh. Uh, for anyone that's coming into maybe buying their first property or their first investment property, yeah. um, when should they be looking to engage yourself to to get the ball rolling on building and pest report? Well, there's two there's two there's there's two people predominantly involved in in um, the pest report. It's either the vendor or it's the purchaser. So we talk about the vendor to start with. The vendor will probably want to engage us, you know, when they list the property. Um, yeah. 
or some time around that time. Sometimes they'll list it and they'll wait till they get some interest in the property before they get it so that the, the date on the report still has validity. Um, you know, particularly in this market, you know, houses are selling fairly quickly. So when they list, um, in terms of the purchaser, I would suggest once the purchaser's found a property that they like, if there's not a report in existence, I would suggest they probably um, make sure their finances is where it's supposed to be. They make an offer, um, and generally they'll have a cooling off a cooling off period. They'll want to get us in that cooling off period as quick as they can. Yeah. Um, and the report will generally be turned around within 24 hours. So let's say they make the make the offer on the Monday and then they engage, engage someone to do it on the Tuesday. They'll yeah. have it back on the Wednesday. Um, and then they've still got two days left on their cooling off period. But um that it's all it's all dependent to upon um how the purchase is conducted. So you know, in some instances in this hot market that we're in at the moment, a lot of the agents are, are trying to sell with um with a 66w so yeah there's even less time you know so maybe they'll make the offer if there's a 66w they'll want to get us in before they um actually exchange on the property so yeah perfect uh and is that the same type of scenario heading into an auction uh which is you're you're generally there prior to the auction then isn't it yeah, yeah. So going back, the vendor will get us, the vendor in some instances will get us to do the job or the agent on behalf of the vendor will do the, the report um, for the sale of that property. Um, and then the agent can then forward that uh, report on to potential purchases. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, that report um, has validity to whoever buys the, buys the, uh, the property. Wonderful. Uh, mate, from my own experience, when I've been, when I've been looking to buy our, our family home and even when the clients go out to for open inspections and they had the building and pest report already provided mm. by the agent or the vendor, some people are less inclined to trust that report going, okay, it's paid by them, so therefore it's going to say what it, what the report yeah. wants them to say. For example, from your, from your experience, is that a myth or does that have any merit to it at all? Well, look, I can only talk from how we operate, um, yeah. but uh, we'll conduct the report on our terms um, without any input from the agent. In fact, I've, it's never been suggested by me, by any agent in the mm. order to to try and do a report that will favour favour the vendor to encourage the sale. The insurance that we have on our business, our professional indemnity insurance, is about anywhere from six to ten thousand dollars a year, depending on our turnover. So mm. um, you really don't want to risk your business by not putting something in that needs to be put in. So like I said, I can only answer um, on our behalf on how we operate, um, but uh, we've never been in the case where we've been encouraged to not put something in the report that should be in there. So, um, yeah. I, I guess it speaks to, uh, it probably speaks to the buyer's mindset at the time. You know, they're coming to a little bit, maybe I wouldn't say cynical is the word, but they've got their guard up and, um, you know, they're, they're, the people around them are saying, just, you know, dot your I's, cross your T's, for example, and make sure the building pays, you pay for that yourself. And so I think maybe some of that's legacy or sometimes there's a bit of hearsay to go, now you've got to go go and do things independently. But, mate, anyone that's a professional in your industry, in our industry, is always acting in be, in the right um, for the right client as well, and making sure that their their intentions are pure, isn't it, mate? Well, that's it. I mean, you live and die by your reports. You know that that's your that's your business. You know you you, you want to have a good ethical, honest business. Um, you want to have a good name in the industry. Um, yeah, and there's only one way to approach that. So, yeah, um, you know, I, I understand that some people will have that cynical view that uh, they should um, get their own maybe and there may be some um, underlying sort of context between the, the to the vendor and the agent but um, in in my from what I've seen and the way we conduct business is just not even it's not even talked about so no, well said yeah. well said excellent Matt I've picked up a few reports in my time not not, yeah. a, not as probably as many as you had but yeah uh, yeah and I glanced through it like I think I know what I'm doing but yeah. and, um but for your trained eye, I mean, the detail is very comprehensive. It's very long. Yep. For someone that's um, not as well versed or the uninitiated buyer, for example, what should they really be looking at? And I guess the next question to that is, what is a deal breaker or what is common as well? Well, it, it is very subjective, right? So it depends on your, who you're doing the report for. You really need to know your client. And what I often say to the, the client when we're doing the report is, um, What's your intention with the property uh, on what's your background? Because um, what's, what's a major issue for me may not be a major issue for someone else. But in the context of the actual report and the standard we work under, it's two components to it. There's a major defect 
and there's a minor defect. Okay. Um, so a major defect would be probably something that they would be interested in is major defect would be considered um, something that will affect the overall performance of the property um, that has some correlation to one of the major building elements. So um, let's, the major building element would be the roof framing, um, the subfloor framing, waterproofing, roof sheeting, things like that. Okay. So uh, then we look at minor defects. You know, you, you may talk about internal areas, you know, cracked tiles, loose door handles, mm. uh, you know, minor weather damage, things like that. So major defects are what people are generally interested in, things that are going to cost them money and things yeah. that aren't repaired are going to affect the overall performance of the property. Mm. And then what doesn't get included in the report? So I know there's certainly some, some elements, say, your plumbing electrical. So what, what, what isn't included as part of your scope of works? Now, what's not included, obviously, um, licensed trades like electrical and plumbing. Um, yeah. We will comment on something if it's blatantly obvious in regards to electrical and plumbing. Um, the other thing that we don't comment, comment on is not talked about a lot is latent conditions. So a latent conditions is something that, that we can't see. Uh, I, I can't see what's under the ground. I can't see behind wall sheeting. Um, I can't see behind stored goods. I can't see into closed or small spaces where I can't get. Um, the important thing um, for people to understand is that what we do is a visual inspection. We generally don't use instruments or, or we do use a moisture meter. We gen- generally don't use invasive instruments. So yeah. um it's all basically on our eyes. So anything, any latent conditions we can't see, and there are a lot of the disclaimers that are in the report. So a general walkthrough or an inspection of a property um, is talking about the overall condition of the property at, at that current time when we do the inspection. So, okay. Yeah, great. What about something like non-council approved erections, like say garages or decks? I know when we bought ours, it had had a non-council approved deck, for example. So yeah. what about, I guess, mentioning that or referencing that as well? Is that part of part of your scope of works? Absolutely. So we'll always reference um, decks. Decks are a big a big problem because mm. um, generally, well, in a lot of cases, decks are put up on the weekend by, you know. <laughs> the weekend warrior. Bill and Ben, you know, they put them up on the weekend. So, uh, But generally for the trained eye, you can generally tell whether something should uh, has been through the approval process or whether something has just been put up yeah um, and that that depends on on how the place is how it's built um how far off the boundary it may be whether it's been built over any easements or um, mm. inspection outlets so um, there are a number of different things that we look for um that we may and, and at that point in time we may only indicate to the to the purchaser listen um this may not be council approved we we really do recommend you go to council and seek any um development approvals that have been through um, and if there's nothing there then um, you, you should probably ask some more questions to the to the vendor or to the agent um, and find out whether it has got a, a development consent through so because it, it can be a big it can be a big difference in price you know you talk about uh, you know on plan on council records it may only be a two-bedroom house with no garage and then what's being sold is a, a three-bedroom house with a garage so mm. there's a significant difference there so um, I think it's really important. Excellent. I mean, as someone that specialises in the Wollongong area, obviously there's been a, a number of um, you know, Sydney siders on the on the sea change. And so when they're coming down here, um, what are some of the common areas that are exclusive or that feature in, in the Wollongong um, district, mate, from, from what you see? Wollongong is generally an old town. Um, mm. been built on, on steelwork, um, blood, sweat and tears, and um, a lot of ex-government housing here. So... So we do a lot of inspections on on that type of home, you know, um, brick pier, asbestos clad, you know, that design detached garage. Um, so a lot a lot of subfloor areas um, with with drainage and um, and subsidence issues, right? Um, and then also um, issues with um, asbestos to the to the exterior cladding and and into interior cladding in some instances. So. Mm-hmm. Um, like I said, it's a very old town, um, and generally nine, nine times out of ten, we're inspecting old homes. But um, then you go down further south, and you, you head into the the Shell Harbour area, and you're you're looking at relatively new new, new homes yeah. you know, in the last thirty years, where they're on their slabs on ground, totally different design and different construction types. So um, the Wollongong area is diverse, and there's um, there's a lot of different types of buildings within this area that have different different issues. 
on yeah. Them, so, yeah. Now, one of the ones when I speak to our clients who, you know, probably buy inside the northern Illawarra, um, especially being out near the escarpment, is like mould will pop up yep. as well. So what's kind of your take on mould and, you know, are there, are there ways to prevent it? And when it comes up, what's your first inclination when you see that? Mould's a, mold's a combination of two elements, so um, ventilation and water. Um, you can v- combine no ventilation and high moisture and you'll you get mould. So a couple of things to it. It can it can have a little bit to do with the orientation of the house, which way it's facing, yeah. um, where the bedrooms are and where the living rooms are. Um, but I would say in most instances, mould is generally a contributing factor to the, the people that are living in the house. So um, if you keep the place well ventilated, um, and the outside of the house reasonably neat and tidy, you generally eliminate issues with mould. It's when you um, have excess stored goods inside the home, you lock the windows and the doors up on a regular basis, you don't air the place, that's yeah. when you're going to come up with uh, with mould. In saying that, um, contributing factors to mould are obviously issues with water. So drainage is a really important one, making sure your, your perimeter and subfloor drainage is adequate and working. Yeah, and making sure, like I said, making sure your windows and your doors are regularly open and, and ventilating the home. Yeah, okay. Another another common one that comes up is pools, for example, as well. So what should, what should someone be uh, aware of when they're buying a home that has a pool on it as well, mate? So a number of years ago, the, the New South Wales government implemented um, some changes to the Conveyancing Act and to the um, Tenancy Act pretty much says for the Conveyancing Act, the owner of a home with a pool must either have a certificate of compliance or a certificate of non-compliance, um, and that's in relation to the barrier. So it's a safety check on the barrier. Yeah, okay. Right? So when they list, if you list your house um, for sale, really important that um, you have uh, a swimming pool inspector inspect the, the barrier um, for compliance to either have that certificate of non-compliance or that certificate of compliance attached to the contract of sale because you can't exchange without it. Yeah. Um, in regards to the um, in regards to the Tenancy Act, you must have a certificate of compliance only. You, you can't lease a property without a certificate of compliance. So that's really important. Yeah. So I think it's important if it, when you first engage your agent to get into the to list the property, you either discuss this with them or you discuss it with your solicitor or your conveyancer to mm. initiate that contact to get it done. Excellent. I mean, you mentioned there someone's conveyance arrived. Right? Quite often, you know, oh, from time to time, I see this come up where the building and pest report comes up and then the conveyancer or the solicitor jumps in and says, actually, I've seen this and it's a red flag yep. uh, in, the, in the building and pest. And so the building and pest report was done, but almost looking for reasons to then walk away from the property or walk mm-hmm. away from the deal as opposed to the report should what I'd be called, just should be an enabler. Um, yes. So from your perspective, I mean, is the report there as the reason to buy it? Is the report there as a reason to walk away? Is the report there as, a, as more an education tool? Like which kind of camp do you sit on, mate? Well, look, I'm very pro-property. Property has been very good to me. And um, people come to us, um, in my mindset, people come to us because they actually want to buy the property. It's not because mm-hmm. they want to not buy it. They want to buy it. So if, if there's an issue with a property, I'll generally ring the client and discuss it with them. Everything so you're, open, you're open to that, having an open chat. Absolutely. With them. Absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. I mean, the report is one thing, but actually having a conversation with the inspector and getting their opinion on it is really, really important. Beautiful. Um, like I said, that they want to buy the property. They don't not want to buy the property. Generally, in most, I would say in most instances, um, if there's a red flag there, they can be resolved. It's just a matter of working through it and saying, right, this is the issue. This is how we go about fixing it. Or you know maybe there maybe there can be an adjustment in the price. So um, I think I think in my industry in particular there, there, there may be some inspectors out there that are that are negative and want to maybe de, not derail it but say oh discourage or, 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 yeah discourage it. For me, it's um, an absolute opportunity to encourage people to buy. Um, it's just presenting the information to them in a in a proper manner so they can make an informed decision. Exactly. I guess one of the big things that really sticks out is asbestos. Mm. Uh, so what if you're buying a home that has asbestos, what do you need to know? What are the options around, say, um, getting rid of treating asbestos as well from your experience, Great. Well, asbestos has been around a long time, and in essence, it's a good product. It, 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 um, it absorbs, it, it reflects moisture very well, um, and that's why they use it so predominantly in external cladding and internal wet areas. Um, there's two, two types of asbestos. There's friable and non-friable. Um, yeah. The cladding on the side of the house and the cladding in the internal walls 
is uh, is what they call a non friable product. So it's it's in situ, it's fixed. Yeah, uh, a friable a friable um, asbestos will be lagging around a, a water pipe, or you know, in some cases, loose insulation in the roof, which is um, you touch them and and they become part airborne particles straight away. They're they're, they're very hazardous. So. Um, in the majority of cases, particularly in the in the Wollongong area, it's um it's not friable, so it's in situ, it, it's fixed, it's it's not if it's not disturbed, it's not an issue. Okay. Now, asbestos becomes an issue when you create dust, so the particles of it. So I'll say to people, um, Isaac, they'll say, Greg, is, is there asbestos in the place? If it's if it's a property built in the 1960s, 70s, early 80s, 100%, more than 100%, that there's asbestos there somewhere, right? So. It's like, well, what do you intend on doing the place? If you don't intend on doing anything other than painting and decorating, generally asbestos is fine. If you're planning on renovating um, or uh, deconstruction in some regard, I, I, I recommend you either get those areas tested before you deconstruct yourself or get a professional in. Uh, most mm. most builders these days, carpenters, know how to handle asbestos and they'll they'll treat it appropriately. So. Okay. Um, although it, although it's a, a scary point for some people, um, a little bit of knowledge can um, you know point you in the right direction. So excellent. I mean, you're bang on there with about knowledge. So knowledge, you know, knowledge is power. Knowledge is mm-hmm. being able to make confident decisions. And mate, I just want to say thank you very much for sharing your knowledge. You know, you've obviously sit on a mountain of uh, a mountain of insights and, and expertise, and probably completing hundreds, if not thousands, of property reports in your time. You've seen it all, right? So. Kind of to anyone, you lean on that type of that wisdom and that type of insight to go with. If you've done this thousands of times, you know what the trained eye is looking for. You're you're paying a building inspector to act on your behalf, so they're always got your best interests at heart as well. So it's about just making sure you've got a very good open relationship to say Look, this may be what we're intending to do with the property, or or if we decided to knock down and rebuild. Would the asbestos become an issue and That's arming right. yourself with those decisions up front? So you, there's really no nasty surprises once you have bought a, a property That's right. or an investment that you've gone into it eyes wide open and knowing what's a deal breaker and what's a deal maker as well. Mm. Greg, I just want to say thank you very much, mate. Wonderful. Um, I'm, I'm sure that you know, a number of our clients have, have engaged you and uh, the feedback has been overwhelmingly positive, mate. So that's why we want to bring you on and, and shoot the breeze and answer a few questions. So you've certainly done that. So thank you very much on behalf of us and our listeners. And um, we will also include some details to your to your website and to get in touch with you if anyone is looking to buy their next investment property or home in the in the Wollongong Illawarra uh, region as well. But that has been a wrap Greg, thank you very much. Thanks, Aaron. We'll catch everyone on another episode of the Australian Property Investment Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron. If you've got some feedback, please get in touch with us as well. Uh, if you've loved it, give the star, give the episode a rating as well. And we'll look forward to sharing with you on another episode shortly. Thanks. Thanks.